Welcome to the North Pentecostal Church live stream, a place to be family. Good morning, everybody. It is so nice to see all your beautiful faces. Uh, before we go into some uh, announcements, we thought let's let's start this morning just praising His name and getting ready to worship. So those that can stand, please stand. You're always free to worship Him the way you you feel. Let's let's worship. Let's praise His name. just feels like that's the right way to start service yeah. and then have a quick break. You don't have to sit because I'm going to have one announcement. It's going to take 10 seconds and then get right back into worship. That's the way we get our Sundays going. I came up a little early. I apologize for that. My simple announcement is this annual general meeting end of March. Uh, I think all of our reports in so we don't have to hassle anyone about those. 
Um, just a reminder for our members that nominations close next week. If you have not put your nomination form in for elections for board members, please do so today, no later than next Sunday. After service closes next Sunday, nominations are closed. So that'll be your last opportunity. Let's go right back into worship. I'm going to pray. We're going to get moving. We're going to uh, just enjoy what God is doing. We're excited today to have Ed Dixon with us to share uh, many things. And we're just going to continue to seek the presence of Jesus in the midst of it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you are doing in the midst of this place out of your goodness, your faithfulness, and your mercy to us. As we worship you, Lord, we ask that you would come and that you would have your way in our hearts, that you would remove our agendas and make this day about you. We surrender to the move of your hearts and your hand. Come and speak to your people. We ask in your wonderful name. Amen. Hosanna.
Just want you, Lord. Oh, you are so beautiful. 
Oh! 
nothing is. Nothing is impossible. You are the healer. Nothing is impossible. Broken marriages, Lord, you nothing are the healer. Is impossible for you. You hold my world in your hands. Depression and anxiety, Lord, that is not impossible. Hallelujah. 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 
This is the invitation of our God. If this practice is new to you, it is our understanding as Christians in this house that when God wants to visit his people, he will sometimes bring a message through his servants. It is his gift of mercy to us. It is a form of love, expression to us. And today he has invited us to allow him to be in a place high above all else. The throne of our heart where he would reign in form and function as our God to be high and lifted up. It's an invitation for us to take a moment and respond. We don't have to be loud. We don't have to be quiet. We can respond in our way. If your response is simply to shout hallelujah, to clap your hands, to sing, to just rest in quietness, your response is accurate to what the Spirit is doing in you right now. So I invite you for the next few seconds to take some time and respond to the invitation God has given you to let him have that highest place of honor, to rest on your heart, to be your God, your King, to invite him in this moment to move. Let's take a moment and respond to this.
Jesus, you are high and lifted up in a place above all others of highest honor in our lives. Father, we thank you that you visit your people, that you are not a God who has removed himself, but you daily rest upon the hearts and the lives of those who seek you. And we give you praise that you have shown your face in this place today and you have spoken through your servants. Father, as we progress today and we hear reports through Ed, would you be glorified in all we do and hear? We bless you above all others today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to take a moment uh, before Ed comes. We got one special announcement. We're going to dismiss the children to go off to their ministry, make their way out the back, and find your super church and preschool and nursery leaders. One of the things that I love to do when we have opportunity is to um, introduce a new, not achievement, but a new blessing that somebody has had. And we'll get to that in a moment. Um, but first, I'm going to ask Leanne to come. She's going to share an update about um, her work with Scott Cooper and Street Level Advocacy. She's going to share kind of everything she does, uh, a little update about the sandwiches that she's been doing. And it's interesting that Ed's here who does loads of love because Leanne does loaves of love. <laughs> so you can grab that mic, yeah. And uh, so she's going to share for one or two minutes just about the plethora of things that she's involved in, and then I'll, uh, I'll announce something else. Still learn how to work a mic, apparently. Um, lots of stuff has happened in, in this last year. Uh, I'll start with the Loaves of Love program, and I'm going to thank you for being my pilot church in September. So since you guys decided to support me and help me get this going, we now have five churches that are a part of this program. And about 60 people that are involved in this ministry. We are making 1,000 sandwiches a month. And other than being bossy, I do none of it. So thank you very much for every person who has taken the time and invested the resources to make this program so successful. I appreciate you all. There's a little bit of a switch with that. So I'm going to start doing sign-ups in the foyer as well. Once every three months kind of works for me. And you just pick a weekend that works for you. And you can do one loaf. You can do three loaves. It really is individualized. So if you want more information, I am in the lobby today after church. Um, some of the other things that has been going on with street level. So I go out three mornings a week. That's Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. Uh, I'm partnered with Master's College. I have a student with me this year. She's amazing. Um, I enjoy her. I also have had the wonderful pleasure of having our very own Gideon Latone spend some time with me in a co-op for his high school credits. So that has been amazing. Um, and I've built some really big relationships with our street-affiliated population in, in Peterborough. And these are like solid um, times where I'm able to invest and be a real boots-on-the-ground representation of God's love. So the sandwiches seem, you know, like a little thing that we can have a reason to go. It's part of that. We're not only just feeding bellies, but it gives me an opportunity amongst the other things that we do. We distribute clothing and supplies and, you know, heat sources and hot pockets as we were collecting. You guys did a great job of that this winter. Thank you. And um, it really gives us an ability to build kingdom relationships that are lasting. We've had salvations amongst our street-affiliated population. We have people that go to church on Sunday now that didn't go to church before. I had a young fella that I met six months ago that, you know, had a very peculiar response. I'm going to just leave it at that. To, you know, any idea of speaking about God. And a month ago, he asked me for a Bible, and he said it was because he'd built a relationship with me. So it's not that I'm special, it's just all of the times that I get supported in doing these things gives us this opportunity to reach into these lives in a very tangible way. 
And so these things couldn't happen without the support of wonderful people like you guys. And I really appreciate you, and thank you very much. So two things that uh, I get to mention about Leanne is the first, she has received her, her are you now designated as a licensed minister, as credentialed with the POC? And she is also a Mission Canada worker. So two, two very important designations that bring us to a further announcement about Leanne and that we have as a leadership uh, moved, uh, voted on, and pushed through that she is now on our sponsored table of missionaries. So she receives from our budget a certain amount a month. Um, and she also receives when you, I know last year there was some confusion, but if you designate to general mission or world mission instead of a person, we split that amount between six different areas. And so I'm not going to try to do math, but if in a month $1,000 comes from that, Leanne receives a sixth of that. You do your own math. Uh, <laughs> it's not working today. I'm sorry. I could have done a fifth. That was easy. So she'll receive that portion of it, as well as anything that is designated to Leanne Davidson or Street Level Advocacy. That'll go through Mission Canada, and then she gets that as part of her um, budget for the year to make sure that everything runs accordingly to what she has set out. So we're going to take a moment. We're going to pray over her. If you want to designate in that function, you are welcome to um, with her name or street level advocacy. If you're just giving towards missions in general, she will always receive that portion as well on a monthly basis. So we're just blessed to know that God is moving in all of our people. This is one example. Know that when God calls you, he sees it through. He is faithful to do that. Can I have, Heidi, can you come and join me and we'll pray over Leanne and bless her and right there. She doesn't want to be right here, but this is where we're going to pray. Join me as we pray. Father, thank you for Leanne. We thank you for her family. We pray that you would set an incredible blessing upon them as they serve you, not only in this function, but in many others. We thank you for the credentialing. We thank you for the Mission Canada worker status. But God, we just thank you for her humility and her obedience. May she be a model for those in this room and watching online who say, I just want to know what God wants of me. We spoke about it a few weeks ago. Your kingdom comes when your will is done. So Lord, let your will be done in Leanne's life that your kingdom would flow in those who are uh, affiliated with the street. Let them know your love because of what she does. So Father, bless her with an incredible abundance of sandwiches, of the hot hands, of everything that she does, let there be so much she has to give to other organizations. Bless her in great abundance as she incredibly blesses others. In your wonderful name, amen. You can congratulate Leanne in your moments and uh, just bless her in those times when you get an opportunity to talk to her. We're going to invite Ed to come. He's going to share whatever's on his heart. I know he's got some photos, maybe videos, other things. But, um, Ed, I met you when I was 17. Wow. Down at Evangel in Chatham. Really? Kevin Broadwood introduced me to you. Oh. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of names in there. I was playing baseball with Aaron Pilon wow. and Mark Steinfield. And Kevin had us over at his house, me and a bunch of the guys. And you were there. Wow. And that was my introduction. And then, you know. Ukraine came up, and I think you were already going at that point, but loads of love started, and yeah, so I've known you for 25, wow. 26 years. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah. So there's a good, there's a great I'm history old. to it. There you go. <laughs> Welcome, Ed, as he shares. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Wow. Norwood Pentecostal Church. Man, I'm so happy to be here. Seriously. Uh, this is like a homecoming. I was standing out there in the lobby drinking coffee, and I felt really like I, I had come home, you know. And uh, seeing so many of you uh, just brings back so many memories. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. Just really, really excited. I hope that I can give you just a little bit 
back uh, to you for what you've been given to me over the years and, uh, and your faithfulness uh, for supporting missions. I think it was, yeah, about 25 years ago. I've been in Ukraine for 27 years. About 25 years ago, I was here for the first time. And I think it's kind of fitting that on the anniversary of the war in Ukraine that I would be here today just to encourage you guys. And you know what I noticed? God is here. Yeah, he's here. And uh, Jesus is here. He said, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, I am there with you. And I would not be here if Jesus wasn't here. I would not be even doing anything or be able to talk about anything I'm going to talk about today if he wasn't in my life, if he hadn't changed my life. And the Holy Spirit is here. He's here. I think that's amazing. I, I, you know, uh, when the message was given this morning, I was praying this week that God would give me a message for you guys. I don't want to come up and I can do Uncle Ed's slideshow, you know. <laughs> I mean, I can do that and I'm going to do that. But I really want to speak to you. I really want God to speak to you through me and the words that I say. And uh, God spoke to me. There's a phrase that we hear very often today that hasn't been said very often for thousands of years. It's a simple phrase. You'll be surprised to know that this phrase hasn't been said very often for thousands of years. And the phrase is, where are you? <laughs> you know, we say it all the time now because we're on the phone. We're talking to someone. We say, hey, where are you? I say it to my daughters all the time. <laughs> Where are you? We hear it all the time, but for thousands of years, you wouldn't go up to someone and say, where are you? And many years ago, God said that to Adam. Remember? In the book of Genesis, God said to Adam, where are you? And it wasn't because he didn't know where he was physically. It's because he didn't know where he was spiritually. And God speaks to us very often. Where are you? And God gave me a message for you today. And at the end of the service, I'm going to tell you where you are. This is, you know, I think only God can speak to us in certain ways and help us to understand certain things. Because many times I wonder myself, Lord, where am I? What's happened? But God has an answer for us. And he, he just really gave me a revelation today to share with you. I'm going to start off, though, with the slideshow. <laughs> and uh, if you can put the first slide up there. This is my beautiful family. Uh, I'm so blessed. I am so blessed. God has just poured out his love on me. Many of you know my story from the past. I was lost. I was lost in alcohol. I, I lost everything. Uh, came into the church like this, sat in the back row for eight months. <laughs> eight months sitting in the back row, just kind of trying to figure out what is this all about? Like, what are these voices I hear? What are, what, what's going on for eight months until God got a hold of me and began to speak to me? Amen. I gave my life to him. And he's turned my life around completely. I mean, here I am. This was taken a year, a half, year and a half ago when we were on our way to Ukraine. Look at that. I'm surrounded by beautiful girls. <laughs> That's what I wanted all my life. <laughs> God knew, right? I mean, even the dog is a girl. <laughs> and uh, I've just been blessed, like blessed beyond measure. I, can, I could stand here and talk about these characters all day long and uh, just really... Our oldest daughter is actually 25. She's not in that picture. We were actually on our way back to Canada for her wedding. She got married. Uh, great guy. Like just, uh, again, so blessed I was able to do their wedding. And uh, God just poured out his blessing on it. If you go to the next picture, I want to talk a little bit about this little. This is Steffi. She's five years old. She's my daughter. You're wondering, how old is that guy? Right? <laughs> I honestly, when, when she was, when she was going to be born and I was, you know, thinking about it all, and I, I really, just like you, 
I was praying, Lord, give me the energy. <laughs> Please, give me the energy that I need. And you know what? He does. God gives you everything you need, just what you need. It's amazing. And she gives me so much life, just, just amazing. Uh, I was sitting with her on the couch a while ago. She looked at me and she said, Dad, can I have a popsicle? I said, we're going to have to ask your mom. She said, you don't know? <laughs> Which I replied, actually, I'm just your dad. <laughs> and she said, and dads don't know anything? And I was thinking, you don't know how close to the truth you are with that right there, <laughs> right? She's just such a blessing. And, um, you know, when the war started in Ukraine, we just happened to be here in Canada. We were on furlough. And you may think, well, just by chance we happened to be here. Well, I know now, of course, God had a plan. God was not surprised. He was not surprised at all. In fact, he had it all arranged. And here we were with everything set up, all the banking, everything set up so that we could, you know, just get going. Many people would ask me in the early part, I just wanted to go back to Ukraine. And my board at Loads of Love were telling me, you know, Ed, just relax. Maybe God has you here for a purpose. Maybe he wants you to coordinate things and to do things that you could couldn't do if you were there, here. And I've been traveling back and forth, and some people will ask me, what's it feel like when there's a war going on in the country you've lived for 27 years, and you're here? And I said, you know, it's, it's hard. I guess I would think of it like, and I used to tell them, I would think of it like, imagine if your child was dying, in the hospital, in a hospital room, and, and doctors were working on her, and you were standing outside, and there was nothing you could do. Nothing you could do except pray. Maybe get her mom a cup of coffee. Like, do whatever you could. Whatever you could just to help, right? And that's the way I felt about this country that God had given me a burden for. And then something interesting happened. Maybe interesting, I don't know. It's like in November of last year, I came down the stairs one morning in my house, and my daughter was downstairs already, and she came out of the, there's a little bathroom on the main floor, and I looked at her, and she was just white, like someone looks like when they're dying. And I went into the bathroom, and I, and, I'm, and she's almost falling over, and I looked, and the toilet was full of blood. And I was like, what in the world is going on? I grabbed her. I picked her up. I yelled for her mom, and I said, we got to go right now. Ran out to the car, put her in the car as fast as we could to the hospital. Got into the hospital, into emergency. Ran in with her, and as soon as we got her in, the doctors started working immediately, trying to figure out what was wrong. They had her all hooked up to everything all over the place. And uh, there was nothing I could do. I could just watch. I would go up to her and I would hold her. And, and then within 40 minutes, we were, we were living in Barrie at the time. There was, a, there was a vehicle from Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto there full of doctors. I was just, I couldn't believe it. And they started working on her, and one of the doctors came up to me and told me one of the worst things you ever want to hear, your daughter is dying. <laughs> and I'm, I, I didn't know what was going on. I was just, you can, you can imagine, I'm just overwhelmed. How can this be happening? It doesn't make sense. And I went up to my daughter before the sick kid's ambulance went to take her away, and I, I just put my arms around her, and all I could do was say, sweetie, everything's going to be okay. And you know what she said? I mean, I had to drive. I knew I was, they were going to take her and my, and my wife to the hospital. I had to drive separately all the way from Barrie to Toronto. And just before I left, 
My daughter whispers to me, Dad, I love you endless. And I was like, that's the worst thing you could have possibly, <laughs> you know, said to me right at that moment. And you can imagine my ride to Toronto and I'm crying in the car and crying out to God. God, I know if you take her now, I know she'll be with you. I know she will. But please don't take her. Leave her with me just for a little while longer. And right now, folks, you're imagining how much I love my daughter. You're imagining how much love genuinely a father has for a child. And I'm telling you today, that's the way God feels about you. It's exactly how he feels about you. We got to the hospital and they saved her life. They did, I think, six blood transfusions altogether. And they were basically giving her new blood. And we found out that what had happened was that for some reason, her immune system began to attack her own red blood cells instead of attacking, which it usually does, the infection. And basically, she was bleeding internally and dying from this. And we began to pray because the doctor said, we don't know, but we can try to replace the blood. But we don't know if it's going to turn around, if things are going to get better. We just don't know. It hap doesn't happen very often. And so we started to pray, and there were people here. Someone came up to me this morning and said, we were praying for your daughter. And on Sunday at noon in the hospital, and I knew people were praying all over, at Sunday at noon, suddenly, it was like the life just, like somebody flicked the switch and the life just came back into her. And we had a miracle. Our daughter was saved. Praise God. Just, you can imagine. You can imagine how we felt. You can imagine. And then the questions began to come. Like, is she going to be fine? Is she going to be, you know, is this going to last? Is it really a miracle? Did this really happen? And every test we've had ever since then, I can tell you, my daughter is not 100%. She's 120%. <laughs> Every single test we've had. Praise God. I've just been amazed. And you know, God began to speak to me. You know what he spoke to me? Remember what you said about Ukraine? Remember what you said about how you felt and what you could do, right? Every little thing you do matters. Every little prayer you pray matters. Because God wants to do a miracle. And if we believe for Ukraine in the same way, if we believe for that situation, God could do a miracle. But it's up to us to believe, to believe that. Because most people today are saying, this is not going to end. This is, there's no hope in sight. There's just going to be more death. But you know what? We as believers, we need to believe. Believe that great things could happen, that God could do amazing miracles. Jesus said, my father is always working. And I have good news for you today. God is working. God is always working. He's always working, doing amazing things. And we need to keep in mind that he is working. He does have a plan. He knew about this all along. And uh, a miracle could happen right before our eyes. So if you go to the next picture... I want to show you, this is a girl I've talked about here in church before. You guys know about her. When I first went over to Ukraine and I started working in the orphanage, uh, there were 126 kids there. The local people called it the place that God forgot because they would see these kids with disabilities all over in the yard. They could see them from their apartment buildings, and that's what they called it because they believed these kids had no hope. And we started to work with them, and... Natasha has no use of her arms and legs, uh, and she was actually, at that time, she got around on her belly on a little platform that had wheels on it, and they would pull her around with a rope in the orphanage, and one day they pulled her up to an uh, art class where some of the kids were learning to paint, and uh, she looked up at the art teacher who was from a local church there, and she said, I want to paint. Well, he just looked at, he told me later, he said, Ed, 
I felt so awkward. I didn't know what to do. I just looked at her like, you want to paint? And she said, yeah. She said, put the brush in my mouth. And Natasha began to paint. Uh, Natasha's paintings have sold around the world for over $2,000 each. Praise God. God is doing amazing things for these kids. So just before the war, Natasha says to me, we were in the city of Dnipro. Natasha says to me, just before the war started, nobody believed the war was going to start. I didn't believe the war. Like everybody in Ukraine, there was no way because it didn't make any sense. There was no logic to it. Like why would Russia invade Ukraine? Like that doesn't make any sense at all. So nobody believed it, even when they were hearing reports about it. And there I was a week before the war started, and uh, I'm with Natasha. You know what she said to me? She said, I have this feeling, I believe, I'm going to be living in North America soon. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, that's kind of hard to believe. I didn't say that to her, but really I'm thinking to myself, how is a person with no use of their arms and legs who lives in a you know, an institution in Ukraine. We're trying to help her, you know, and we're doing everything we can. She's making some money off her art. But, and she said, no, no, not only that. I'm going to be living in North America in a beautiful apartment near the waterfront. Like, I just, and I'm like, wow, this girl just has so much faith. These kids put us to shame, you know, the things that they believe. And then the war started. We had to evacuate children. We evacuated over 1,000 orphan kids to other countries. Natasha went to Romania. The kids went all over the place. And we were working with global workers in different parts of Europe, you know, organizing everything, getting them there. And then Canada opened up the borders to Ukrainians if they wanted to come. So Natasha was in Romania. And I said to her, like, what do you think about coming to Canada? She said, yes. Next thing you know, she was on a plane, and I'm thinking, where is she going to live? <laughs> what are we going to do? I called Pastor Tim Gibb down at Sarnia. I said, Tim, we need something, you know, and he was bringing in some other Ukrainians. An organization called Vision in Sarnia contacted Pastor Tim and said, we have an apartment on the waterfront. <laughs> We'd like to give it to her for a year, free. <laughs> Unbelievable. So next thing you know, she's on her way. She's there. We brought a caregiver with her, this be beautiful lady from Ukraine to come with her and be with her all the time. And there she is in her brand new apartment. It's brand new. No one's ever even lived in it before. Like just a beautiful place. And then I got a call from uh, the, one of the members of parliament, uh, a person that works for the member of parliament down there, and said to me, what have you done? And I'm like, what? Why would you bring this girl here to Canada? I said, well, because she was fleeing the war. And they said, she can't work here. She can't, like, she can get a job, but what, how is she going to support herself? She needs 24-hour care. What if the girl that's with her right now can't be with her anymore? Who's going to pay for that? That could cost, like, $10,000 a month or more just to pay for the care that she would need, 24 hours a day and all the. And they started to go at me, and I'm like, Wow, I'm sorry, I just didn't think about all those things. <laughs> Honestly, like we were just responding as fast as we could. And I thought, well, the only way is if she would get permanent residence. And the lady said to me, she will never get permanent residence in Canada in the situation that she's in, you know. Well, I had a lady that I knew that had a friend who was a lawyer helping people with permanent residency. And so I said to her, can you contact this guy? She contacted him. The lawyer in Toronto said, you know, I can submit her permanent residency documents and I can do all the work. There's really not a big chance that she would get it, but I could do it. But it would cost about $8,000 altogether for his services. So I, I said to the lady I knew, can you call him back? Ask him if he'll do it for free. <laughs> Why not ask, right? So she, she called him, asked him, and you know what? He said, all right. 
He submitted the documents. I'm, I'm not exaggerating here, folks. He submitted the documents for a permanent residency. She got an answer in two weeks. They said yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. I've never even heard of that before. Like, I've heard maybe six months or, you know, like, I've never heard of that. Two weeks. Somebody in there is, like, moved by the Spirit of God. I'm telling you. Just amazing. And there she is now, uh, permanent res All the, you know, basically the rights of any Canadian citizen living in Sarnia in a beautiful apartment uh, right on the waterfront. Like, just, just unbelievable. And this is God in the midst of tragedy, doing amazing things. In the midst of what we think is horrible, God is doing uh, miracles. You go to the next picture. <laughs> i got to get on with the slideshow here. Uh, so when we first went back to Ukraine in April, I ended up trying to get into the area where our house was. And uh, You've heard of Bucha in Irpin? Well, our house is in the middle of that area. And I really genuinely thought that our house was gone. Like, and we were kind of settled on that. Uh, we got into that area, and nobody had been in there from our mission before because they couldn't get in. And uh, the war had been raging all around there. So within a kilometer of our house, I counted 15 destroyed Russian tanks within a kilometer of where our house was. I mean, there were houses just flattened. Tanks had driven right through them. It was horrible. And, and uh, gradually, we got closer and closer. Out. The grocery store that we used to shop at was gone. Like, it just does not exist. The gas station where we used to get gas was gone. Like, it's just an open, uh, just a flat parking lot. That, like, nothing left. And we got to the house. And there it was almost like as if there had been a bubble around it, you know? <laughs> Not even one window broken. Like, it was just unbelievable. And, and I, you know, it's not like I felt, well, oh, we're so much better than the other people who had the... But it was just a sign for me that God was saying, you know, I'm in control. Don't worry. And uh, I think the, you know, just the, uh, the situation sometimes gets beyond our control. The situation just seems so unbelievable, just like nothing we expected. And it can seem to us like there's no hope. It can seem to us like there's no chance for God to do anything great. But we must believe. We must always just believe that God could do great things. If you go to the next picture there, we have 40 full-time staff in Ukraine. This is just in one uh, city of Kriverog, where some of our staff are. And so before I came to Canada, we had everything all set up ahead of time. You know, the accounts just so we could transfer funds, everything. And these are amazing people. I mean, we've all been amazed, right? At Ukrainians? Like, come on. It's unbelievable. They're showing their true colors. They're showing their strength. Uh, and, and they, I've very often said, if there is ever a worldwide uh, economic crisis, if, if there ever is. Some people say it's coming, but if there ever is, I want to be in Ukraine. Because for them, it'll be nothing. <laughs> It'll just be, oh, okay, yeah, that's another thing to deal with, all right. And uh, it really won't affect them that much because they've been through so much. And these are amazing people. I love, you can, like, look at these people. I've been working for 25 years to get them to smile for pictures. Ukrainians generally don't smile for pictures, so I have to train them. And there's one guy there, you can see him right in the middle. I'm still working on him, that one guy. <laughs> the rest of them are doing great, but I'm, you know, there's always one, right? Amazing people. I love Ukrainians. If, if, there, if there are any Ukrainians here, they know that uh, Ukrainians tend to say exactly what they're thinking. Like they just, you know, that's just the way they are. They're just, if you know any Ukrainians, that's what they do. And they're really surprised when they come to Canada and they find out that we don't do that, you know? <laughs> they're just, they just think that we all would say exactly what we're thinking all the time. Uh, I remember <laughs> I took, I shipped a car over to Ukraine once. And <laughs> so my car is going to Ukraine. It actually costs about $1,200 to ship it to Germany. 
I went to Germany, picked up the car, drove it across Germany on Autobahn, you know. Then I got going through Poland. I'm going through Poland. I come up to U Ukrainian border. And the, <laughs> the thing was, I still had my Canadian license plates <laughs> on the car. And there's a guy at the Ukrainian border. He's kind of looking at my license plate. He's looking at me. Looks at my license plate again. He says, where did you drive from? <laughs> I said, from Canada. <laughs> Without hesitation, he just said, way to go. <laughs> And probably later he went back and checked his geography books or whatever. But uh, amazing people. Like I'm just, I'm always completely blown away by these people. Now I think probably having a Ukrainian wife uh, is part of the reason I'm just amazed by these people. They're so strong, so courageous. Uh, they've been through so much, but uh, amazing people. And I'm honored to have these people working with us. We have 40 people that we've known for, many of them for close to 25 years, working with us who we can trust, who we know. And you know what? In Ukraine, even Ukrainians will tell you, it's very important to know who you can trust. <laughs> and thank God we have that. Over 100 churches. We just had a conference a few weeks ago with 100 pastors and leaders from around the country that came together with us and Stephen Herzog, the leader of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, missionaries for that part of the world, was with us. And just, he came back, like, this guy, Stephen, has been on mission trips for over 30 years. And he came out with me and he said, Ed, that's the best mission trip I've ever been on in my life. And it wasn't because of what we saw or did. It was because of the quality of the people that he met. That was it. Go to the next picture. Um, we started giving out groceries during the COVID. And this was God speaking to us about just give them something to eat. I wish I would have thought of this loaves of love. Thing. <laughs> like, I got to trademark that stuff, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, we started giving out groceries. And we, we were just basically taking food to people. Churches were helping. And, and people were genuinely in desperate need of food. This one family, this is Sasha and uh, Sasha the guy and Allah. We, we were taking groceries to people and uh, they told us after that they were standing in their kitchen. They had completely run out of food. Sasha had lost his job because of the pandemic and when everything shut down and they were just, didn't know what to do. Like, the fridge was absolutely bare, and Allah had a disabled brother who was living in the house with them. And they didn't know what to do, and you know what they did? They held hands in the kitchen and prayed. Dear God, please help us. We don't know what to do. And you know what? While they were praying, phone rang. And it was one of our workers telling them, we're bringing food over. Are you guys home? And they were like, yes, we're home. <laughs> and uh, they were so amazed, and they told us this story. And for us, it was like the Holy Spirit was speaking to us that we were doing the right thing. After a little while, we delivered groceries to 5,000 families. I remember the, one of my workers calling me, hey, we just hit 5,000. And I was like, whoa, I didn't even think of it, feeding the 5,000. <laughs> like we're, it was just amazing. And then we eventually hit 10,000. And uh, we were amazed at what God was doing. Over, out of those 10,000 families, over 4,000 people gave their hearts to Jesus Christ. <laughs> Praise God. Like we were just, just blown away. But what I didn't realize at the time was God was just preparing us for what was to come. And uh, so when the war hit, we were ready. We had everything all set up. We had, we, it was just unbelievable. We began delivering food to people. And then Erdo comes along, uh, the emergency relief uh, part of the Pentecostal church, and says, uh, we'd like to support what you're doing. If you go to the next picture, uh, we delivered groceries 
to over 100,000 families in the first part of the world. Just unbelievable. And I, we, we literally lost count how many people prayed with us and gave their hearts to Christ during that time. God just pouring out his spirit uh, upon these people. And uh, we've just been really amazed what God is doing. We evacuated over 20,000 people from war zones, you know, and taking people out. Uh, ladies crying, i never forget, at a gas station, just in tears. We bought her a hot dog at a gas station as we were coming out. And uh, she's in tears, and one of the pastors asked her, is it that bad? <laughs> and, you know, I, I am actually amazed, you know, at uh, these I could go on and on and on about these people. I, I really could. They're unbelievable. You'd think that they would be broken and sad. But you know what? There's joy there. They find joy somehow. They, they, it's, it's unbelievable. It really blows me away. I think, it's, uh, I think it's a real light for us as humans to know if things ever got really bad, you know what? God would give us strength. He would give us everything you need. He would give you everything. You know, if you ever think about things getting really bad in the world around you, you know what? You can know this. God will give you everything you need. He will give you everything you need. He will be with you. Amen. It's amazing. And you will still have joy because you're with him. He's in you. Christ in you. It's unbelievable. You go to the next picture. Uh, we got contacted by gleaners in Canada. You know, they started to send containers through us to Ukraine. One container of their soup mix has one million meals. And so God began to just expand, expand, expand everything that we were doing. And through the churches, uh, you know, how God began to pour out just his love on the people there. If you go to the next picture... Uh, <laughs> Many of you know we do joyful Christmas at Christmas time, remember? And we take happy meals to kids. Well, McDonald's had closed in most of the war zones. And so uh, we just decided we were going to do it anyway. And uh, even though we couldn't get McDonald's, we could get candy and we could get different things for the kids. We could buy them pizza. We could still give every single child vitamins that they desperately need we could do this for the kids at christmas time and we were this past year imagine we were able to bring christmas to over 4000 children in ukraine and god allowed us to do that just our workers and working in these areas you go to the next picture uh in the midst of all this turmoil we we started to hear of god doing amazing miracles so we have one church just outside of Donetsk, and uh, it's in the city of uh, Vuglidar. You'll hear it on the news lately. It's one of the cities like Bakhmut that's being contested right now. There was a big church there that we were supporting. We had actually just sent them $10,000 before the war started to expand their greenhouses of the rehab center. And so the pastor contacted me when the war started, and he said, Ed, uh, would it be all right to use that money to evacuate our church. And I said, absolutely, absolutely. If you feel that's what, you know, you should do. And he did. The entire church was evacuated in vans. They were leaving the city when the war started because they knew it was going to be hit very quickly. And a miracle of God, they got out just, be, just as the missiles started falling. And while they're driving along the road, you can imagine all these church, like it'd be like your whole church, right, is leaving in vans, and while they're driving out, a missile lands in the field right beside them. But it doesn't blow up. Just amazed. Like the pastor said, Ed, I got out of the car. I couldn't believe it. We all stopped, and we, we got out, and he got out, and he took this picture. And I said, <laughs> I said, Dennis, that's not really smart. Like, what if you got over by the missile and you heard, like, tick, 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 <laughs> right? But they were just amazed that God, like, they knew God had done a miracle. 
God had done great things. And something else I want to tell you just before I finish. Go to the next picture. Here's a guy named Sergei. This is going on across Ukraine right now. Listen to me. Sergei, before the war started, had a church, maximum 25 people. Usually he had about 10 to 15 people every Sunday in his church. And he was praying that God would do something. Sergei had to have a full-time job while he was pastoring because the church couldn't support him and his family. So he was working full-time. His wife was working full-time. And then the war started. They're in the city of Zaporozhye, where the nuclear plant is, you know, nearby. And uh, missiles are coming into their city, and they're calling me, what, what should we do? So I said, Sergey, I said, uh, if we were to give you some funds, because of the churches here in Canada that are helping, if we were to give you some funds just for your family, give you some funds for groceries, right, would, would that help? <laughs> Sergey's like, would that help? Of course it would help. Well, Zap, you know, there's a Zap in Zaporozhye. That's Sergei now. Like, he's just on fire for God. He begins to start helping people through their church, taking groceries to people, and just reaching out to people. If you go to the next picture, you'll see his church now. <laughs> Praise God. There's a revival happening in many parts of Ukraine right now. God is pouring his spirit out on these people, and they're coming to Christ in droves. Sergey has over, when I was there, there were over 400 people in the hall altogether, and there were another 100 people in the hallway outside trying to get in. People were saving seats a half an hour before the service started. They were saving their seats with their coats. Just amazing to see what God is doing. And so I want to encourage you today. Whatever we think, whatever we do, God is there. God knows. He's working. He's not surprised by this. He's not surprised by anything that happens in your life. He has a plan. And I told you at the beginning of the service, I was going to tell you where you are. Remember? God says, where are you? Where's John? John, come here. Quick, come up here. Where are you? Where are you, John? You know what I want to tell you? John's right here. It wasn't a surprise to me this morning when I came to church and John was here. It didn't surprise me. I knew where John was going to be. And this is what God told me to tell you. Outside, one day, I was praying. God, have I lost my way? God, am, am I, have I gone off the path? Am, am I really doing your will? You know, I looked up in the sky. I remember, and I was looking up like this when I was praying. And you know what happened? It wasn't snowing outside. Well, it hadn't been right at the time. But I looked up, and quite a bit in the distance, I saw a snowflake coming down. It must have just started to snow. And I saw it, and it came down. And it landed right on my nose. And God spoke to me. He said, Ed, you're right where I want you to be. And that's what God wants you to know this morning. You are right where God wants you to be today. You are right where God wants you to be. God is not some God who's out there angry. Why aren't you here? Why? No, that's not God. God is like this, like a dad. Like a dad who says to you, hey, come over here, sit by me. That's God. So if you ever think that God is somehow wondering where you are or, or upset that you're, no, no. He's just there saying, hey, come over here, sit by me. Thank you very much. team's going to come back and worship in song, and I invite you to respond uh, in your form of worship to the, uh, to the words. It's a new song for some of you, but it'll, uh, it'll touch some hearts.
Many of you know that this month we set aside uh, the entirety of it as a designation towards Lows of Love. I know it was a little bit cheesy because it's February and it's Valentine's, but it, it was a good moment and Ed was available. So um, if you haven't yet done that and you've been waiting for God to speak, um, I don't want to play on emotions. It's not what I do. But if you know the spirit is speaking to you to give towards loads of love, today is that day. If you put it in that box just on your way out, designated to loads of love or to Ed, we'll make sure that all of that 100% goes towards him. Um, we had set a goal as a church for the month of 1500. I can't give you an update because I haven't asked where we're at, but I'm trusting that if we're not there, we'll exceed it. That's what I'm believing. So just pray as the song goes, if God wants you to give, that you'll be obedient and that you'll respond to what he is saying. Can we stand together? Father, thank you for Ed and all the ministry that he does, the incredible work that goes forth from his heart and moves through his hands and his feet. Father, we pray that you would move through him Ukraine and in other areas where he has contact and that you would continue this incredible, marvelous work, the move of your spirit that is not only reaching needs but is bringing salvation to many. It echoes the book of Acts where daily numbers are being added to those who are being saved and that we give you the highest glory for. Fathers, we worship. Speak to us. Just as Ed said, that we would know you are right here. We are here with you. Be in this place in strong fashion, Lord, in Jesus' name.
Father, it is your promise to never leave or forsake us. That's right. We know through story and through visual that you have not left the people of Ukraine. That's right. That you have been amongst them. And you continue to move through others and you move through, through those who live there. That your word would be carried and that needs would be met. That you supply every need. Father, I look forward to many more stories of salvations, of churches filling, of new churches beginning, of needs being met, of incredible miracles taking place. And not just in those areas, but God, that we would catch that too. Father, as we conclude our service, we don't leave here and walk from you. You go with us, whether it be in storm or on mountaintop. You are right there. We thank you for the incredible love that you as a father hold for us. It surpasses all that we can even imagine what that would look like. Father, for any who are removed from it, I pray that they would sense today your arms of embrace, wrapping tight around their hearts, drawing them in, and your tender voice whispering, you are my child and I love you. Father, we bless you and we bless Ed as a church and as a people of God that you would use him in incredible ways. Do so with each one here, we ask in your incredible name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that you have a wonderful afternoon. If you have a chance to congratulate Leanne and to say hello to Ed, we welcome you to do so. See you in a week.